Hastings, 1066. William of Normandy believed he had no option but I to wish I could tell him we'd have his younger brother come visit us. We might be a good influence on him, you know, in this prison. You certainly would be. You know things like German and geology and things like that which can influence man. Mm. Oh, well, I don't think that even I could produce any effect on a person that is permanently weak or hesitant. I'm not sure I would desire to help him. I'm not fond of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. No. As a man so, so let him reap. Yeah, good, that <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, put away your diary, Claire. I don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary to enter all the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I'd forget all about them. Oh, but memory, Claire, is the diary that we all carry about with us. <laughs> yes, but it usually chronicles things that haven't happened or couldn't possibly have happened. I believe memory is responsible for nearly all the trashy romance films about today. Do not criticize romance films, Claire. <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> I uh, wrote one myself in our uh, earlier days. Do you really, <laughs> Miss Prism? Oh, how clever you are. <laughs> I hope it will end happily. I hate films that end happily. They depress me so much. Was your screenplay ever published? Oh, sadly, no, 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 no. The screenplay, unfortunately, was abandoned and by abandoned and lost and slain. Oh, it's terribly unfortunate. Do, 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 oh, here comes Reverend Shaw's walk through the garden. Reverend Shaw's walk, this is indeed a pleasure. <laughs> How are we all this morning? Miss Prism, I trust you're well. Miss Prism's actually just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her well to take a short stroll with you through the garden. <laughs> Clay! <laughs> I've not said anything about a headache! No, but I instinctively felt that you had a headache. I hope, Claire, you've been paying attention. I haven't. Oh, that is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. <laughs> I spoke metaphorically. <laughs> My metaphors were drawn from the bees. Mr. Worthing has not returned from town yet. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't expecting him till, till Monday afternoon, were we, Claire? <laughs> I, uh, I think I will go for a walk with you, Reverend. I, I may have a headache after all. Uh, ooh. <laughs> a walk might do me good. Wicked. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Political <laughs> economy? No. Plan B, British history of the Falklands. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you must be my little cousin, Claire. You're mistaken, I'm not little. In fact, I believe I'm unusually tall for my age. <coughs> But I am your cousin Claire, your Uncle Johnny's brother Frank. My reckless cousin Frank! Oh yes, I have been rather reckless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad to hear it. Although, I don't know why you're here. Uncle Johnny won't be back till Monday. Oh, that's a great shame for me. I sadly must go up to London on the first thing Monday morning. <coughs> I have a business appointment I am anxious to miss. Well, couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? No. The business appointment is in London. Oh, okay. Well, I understand how important it is not to keep business engagements. But still, I think you should wait till Uncle Johnny gets back. I know he wants to speak to you about your emigrating. About my what? You're emigrating. Uncle Johnny's sending you to Russia. To Russia? I'd sooner die. Well, dinner on Wednesday, Uncle Johnny said you'd have to choose between this world, the next world, and Russia. <laughs> Well, from the reports I've heard of the next world and Russia aren't particularly encouraging. This world's good enough for me. <laughs> yes, but are you good enough for it? Well, wouldn't you mind my reforming myself this afternoon? <laughs> it's rather idealistic of you, but I think you should try. <laughs> Thanks, I will. I'm feeling 
better already. Oh, you're looking a little worse. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I'm hungry. I should have remembered. Whenever one's going to lead an entire new life, they need regular and wholesome meals. We can get something from the kitchen. Thank you. You are... The prettiest girl ever. <laughs> Miss Prism says all good looks are a trap. They're a trap which every sensible man would like to get caught in. Shouldn't want to catch a sensible man. I wouldn't know what to talk to him about. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're alone far too much, my friend. You should. You should get married. <laughs> <laughs> By remaining persistently single, a man subjects himself into a permanent public temptation. But is a man not equally attractive when married? Well, no married man is ever attractive except to his wife. <laughs> and often, I'm told, not even to her. Well, this is a surprise. We didn't expect you till Monday afternoon. I have returned sooner than expected. Well, Reverend Chaucer, I hope you are well. Mr. Worthing, I trust these garments of woe do not promise some terrible tragedy. My brother. Oh, more shameful deaths and extravagance. Still leading his life of pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> dead! Hello. <laughs> Your brother Frank, dead. Well, quite dead. Oh, well. What a lesson for him. I hope you will learn from it. Mr. Worthing, I offer my most sincere condolences. At least always know you are the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Oh, poor Frank. We had many faults. It is a sad, sad blow. Very sad indeed. <laughs> Were you with him? <laughs> no. We died abroad. In Paris, in fact. Ah, pity for you. I had a phone call last night with the manager of the Grand Hotel. And was the cause of death mentioned? Oh, severe chill, apparently. Oh, as a man so select in me. None of us are perfect. I myself am particularly vulnerable to a draught. But, Mr. <laughs> Worthy, you would no doubt wish me to make some slight allusion to this on my sermon on Sunday. My sermon on the meaning of manner can be adapted to almost any occasion. <laughs> Joyful, oh. or in this occasion, a distressing. <laughs> I appreciate harvest celebrations, christenings, on days of humiliation, and at festivals. As I preached it last time at the cathedral. Yeah, at a charity sermon for the prevention of the discontent no among the upper orders. <laughs> Are you done? <laughs> now, Reverend, you mentioned christings, I think, there. Well, of course, you have to christen, all right. I mean, you're continually christening, aren't you? Is there an infant in whom you're interested in christening? Ah, but it's not for any child. No, and the fact is, I would like to be christened myself. Well, this afternoon, if you have nothing better to do. Of course, I don't know if you think I'm a little too old now. Not at all. At what hour would you wish the ceremony performed? Oh, I might come round half five if that would suit you. Perfectly, perfectly. But now, Mr. Worthing. I will not intrude any longer in your house of sorrow. No. Just know what seem to us bitter trials or often blessings in disguise. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, oh, Uncle Tony, I'm glad to see you back. Oh, your clothes are horrid. Go and change them. Clay, yeah. Is the matter? You look horrible. But I've got such a surprise for you. Who do you think's in the other room? Oh, Margaret Thatcher. Oh, she better not be. <laughs> no, your brother. Who? Your brother Frank. You're over half an hour ago. I don't have a brother. These are joyful tidings. <laughs> <laughs> My brother Frank's in the next room. Oh, I don't understand. That is quite absurd. Oh, good grief. <laughs> brother John, I have come from town to tell you I am very sorry for my previous actions and fully intend to lead a better life in the future. Uncle Joey, you're not going to refuse your own brother's hand. Nothing will persuade me to take that man's hand. And I can find his coming here disgraceful. He knows perfectly well why. Of course, I do admit that the faults were on my side. But I have to say, I find my brother's attitudes towards me particularly distressing. Especially seeing as this is the first time I've come. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle John, if you don't shake Frank's hand, I will never forgive you. Never forgive me. Never, ever, never. This is the last time I should ever do it. It is perfect, <laughs> is it not, to see such a perfect reconciliation? But now we will leave the two brothers together. Can I come with us? <laughs> Certainly. My little task of reconciliation is over. Oh, you absolute asshole, Andrew! You must leave this place at once! I don't know bumbering here! Well, Claire is a darling! Oh, you're not no. to talk of Claire like that! Your vanity is ridiculous! Your conduct an outrage! And your presence in my household utterly absurd! This bumbering has not been a great success for you. 
Oh, I believe it's been a great success. I'm in love with Claire and that is everything. The history of the Falklands. <laughs> Sedimentary rock. <laughs> oh, close for the version. <laughs> came to water the roses. <laughs> Claire, I hope I would not offend you if I state quite openly and frankly that to me you are in every way bloody lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I find your frankness wonderful, Frank. If you don't mind, I'll take down your mother's my diary. Do you rather keep a diary? It's only a girl's own record of her thoughts and aversions. When it appears in volume form, I hope you will order a copy. But go on, I delight in taking down dialogue. I am... Bloody lovely. <laughs> you can go on. Claire, ever since I first looked upon your remarkable, uncomparable beauty, I dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. I don't think you should say that you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, um, hopelessly. Oh. Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? What was Claire? I, I love you. Oh, you will marry me, won't you, Claire? You silly boy, of course. We've been engaged for the past three months. <laughs> <laughs> for the past three months? Yes, it'll be three months on Thursday. <laughs> Ever since Uncle Johnny said he had a younger brother who was very horrid and bad, you have been quite the topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And, of course, the man who is much talked about is always more attractive. I felt there must be something in it. I fell in love with you. Oh, Frank. darling! How long has the engagement actually been settled? Since February 14th. Worn down by your entire ignorance of my existence right. after a long inner struggle, I accept you onto that tree over there. Then I went into town and bought this little ring in your name. Why did I give you this? <laughs> It's very pretty, isn't yes, it? Yes, you've wonderfully good taste, Frank. <laughs> oh, I feel so romantic. I hope your hair's this colour natural. <laughs> yes, with a little help from others. <laughs> <laughs> I am so glad I finally met you, though. And, of course, your name. <laughs> yes, of course. You mustn't laugh at me, but it's always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone of the name Frank. There's something about that name that inspires absolute confidence. I pity any poor woman that isn't married to someone called Frank. <laughs> yes, me too. But you don't mean to say you could love me if I had any other name? Like what? Oh! I don't know. Andrew! For instance? I don't like the name Andrew. Claire, do you mean to say my name were Andrew? You couldn't love me. I might respect you. I might admire you, but I could never give you my undivided attention. Claire, <laughs> your reverend here is, I suppose, thoroughly experienced in the practice of the uh, church? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Reverend Trusable's a most educated man. I must go see him at once for the most important christening. <laughs> <laughs> Business. Oh. <laughs> I just mean summer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a reckless boy he is. I love the colour of his hair. I should write down some proposals to my diary. <laughs> oh, sorry about the mess. I wasn't expecting company. I'm Claire Cardi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Claire Cardi? What a very nice name. Something tells me we are going to be great friends. I like you already, and my first impressions of people are never wrong. Mm. <laughs> Perhaps I should mention who I am. Mm. I'm Gwendolyn Fairfax. You are here on a short visit, I suppose. No, I live here. Really? Your mother or some elderly female relative lives here too? No, I have no mother, nor in fact any relations. Really? Yes, uh, well, my guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, will look after me. Your guardian? Yes, I'm Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh, oh, that's strange. She never mentioned you. I am not sure, however, the news inspires me with feelings of delight. I 
I'm very fond of you, Claire. I have liked you ever since I met you. But, well, I just wish you were older than you seem to be, and not quite so pretty. <laughs> In fact, if I may speak honestly... Oh, please do. I always think when someone has something unpleasant to say, they should be quite honest. Well, Claire, I wish that you were fully 42 and less than plain. Disloyalty would be as impossible to Frank as deception. And even the most moral men are extremely susceptible to a pretty face. Excuse me, Gwendolyn, did you say Frank? Yes. It's not Mr. Frank Worthing who's my guardian, it's his brother and his elder brother. Frank never mentioned that he had a brother. I'm sorry to say they've not been on good terms for a long time. Oh, that makes sense. Claire, I was growing almost anxious. It would have been awful if anything had come between a friendship like ours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course. You are quite sure that it is not Mr. Frank Worthing who's your guardian? Quite sure. In fact, I am betrothed to him. I beg your pardon? Gwendolyn, I see no reason to keep a secret from you. Mr. Frank Worthing and I are engaged to be married. <laughs> My darling Claire, there must be some mistake. Mr. Frank Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the Morning Post on Saturday at the latest. <laughs> I'm afraid he must be under some delusion, Miss Fairfax. Frank proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. It is only very curious. Well, Frank proposed to me at exactly 5.30 yesterday afternoon. I'm so sorry, dear Claire, but I appear to have the prior claim. There is something more to tell you, dear Gwendolyn, that since Frank proposed to you, he has clearly changed his mind. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my Frank may have gotten himself into, I will never accuse him with it after we are married. Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. Do you suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I am trapped Frank into an engagement? How dare you! This is no time for the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. <laughs> I am glad to say I have never seen a spade. It is obvious that our social spheres have been widely different. <laughs> Frank! Frank! Are you engaged in marriage, Miss Girl? To little Claire? Well, of course not. What could have had such an idea in your pretty little head? I knew there must have been a misunderstanding, Miss mm. Fairfax. This man's my guardian, Mr. John Worthing. I beg your pardon? This is Uncle Johnny. Mm -hmm. Johnny? Oh. Here is Frank. <laughs> Darling! Frank, you refuse to be married to this girl. To what girl? Good heavens! Gwendolyn! Yes, good heavens, Gwendolyn! <laughs> of course not! <laughs> what could have put that idea in your pretty little head? I knew there was some slight error, Miss Cardew. That gentleman is my cousin, Mr. Andrew Moncrief. Andrew? <laughs> is your name Andrew? The nuns gave. I cannot deny it. Is your name really John? I could deny it if I liked. I bet it is John. It's been John for years. We've both been deceived. There's just one question I'd like to ask. A great idea. Mr. Worthing, there's just one question I'd like to put to you. Where is your brother Frank? <laughs> we are both engaged to be married to your brother, cousin Frank. We'd both like to know where he is. Gwendolyn, Claire, it is very painful for me to be forced to speak the truth. <coughs> I'll tell you quite frankly that I have no brother named Frank. I don't have a brother at all. I've never had a brother, and I certainly intend to have none in the future. No brother at all? None. It is clear, Claire, that neither of us is engaged to be married to anyone. Mm. <laughs> oh, this is what you call bumbering, I suppose. Yes! <laughs> and rather wonderful bumbering it is, too. <laughs> the most exquisite bumbering I've ever had in my life. Good God! Your conduct towards Claire, looking at a sweet, simple girl like that, that's quite unbelievable. Not to mention the fact that she's my ward. I can see no possible defence for you taking in a clever, funny, thoroughly experienced young lady like Gwendolyn. And besides, she's my cousin. I just want to be married to Gwendolyn. Well, that's all. I love her. I simply wanted to be married to Claire. I adore her. Andrew, I wish to goodness you would go with <coughs> You can't ask me to go without my dinner. And besides, I have plans with Reverend Chorsky to get christened at quarter to six under the name of Frank. Oh, my dear fellow, 
Well, the sooner you give up that nonsense, the better. I have made arrangements myself with Reverend Chorsful, and I naturally take the name Frank. Besides, I don't want you here. Why don't you go? I haven't finished my tea yet. <laughs> <laughs> I did not follow us leading to the garden. I don't seem to notice at all. Could you cough? Ahem. 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 Oh gosh, they're approaching her forward. We will not be the first to speak, of course. Why did you pretend to be Frank? In order to win your affections. Your Christian names are still awfully unattractive. Our Christian names? Is that all? We're getting christened this afternoon. <gasps> Darling! <laughs> Darling! <laughs> Gwendolyn! What does this mean? I'm engaged to be married to Mr. Worthing, Mother. Come here and sit down! <laughs> Mr. Worthing, the flames of fury that you have lit in me could not even be put out by a hurricane! <laughs> the cries of my daughter's sudden flight by her trusty maid, whose confidence I purchased, I followed her at once. But of course you must understand that all communication between yourself and my daughter must cease immediately. As this, as indeed on all points, I am firm. I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Mrs. Brackle. Oh, excuse me, you are nothing of the kind, sir. And now as regards Andrew. Yes, Aunt Augusta. May I ask if it is in this house that your invalid friend Mr. Bunbury resides? Bunbury? Bunbury? No! <laughs> Bunbury doesn't live here. Bunbury's dead. Dead? <coughs> oh, his death must have been extremely sudden. Yes, I killed him this afternoon. I mean, what? poor Bunbury. He died this afternoon. What did he die of? Oh, Bunbury. He was exposed. Exploded? Was he the victim of a rebellion? I was not aware that Mr. Bunbury was interested in politics. If so, he's been well punished for his morbidity. No, Aunt Augusta. He was exposed. I mean, he was found out. The doctors found out that Bunbury couldn't live anymore, so Bunbury died. <laughs> he seems to have had great confidence in the opinion of his doctors. <laughs> I'm pleased that he's acted under some definite course of medical action. Now, Andrew, who is that young person you're fondling? Uh, uh, that is Miss Claire Cardin, uh, my ward. Claire? Uh, Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged to be married, Mrs. Bracknell. Bracknell, yes. You? I feel it's in my duty to ask a few questions. Mr. Worthing, is Miss Cardew at all connected to any of the larger railway stations in London? <laughs> <laughs> Until yesterday, I had no idea that anyone's origins was tied to a terminus. <laughs> Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Mr. Thomas Cardew, of 149 Belgrave Square. That sounds not unsatisfactory. That's very kind of you, Mrs. Bracknell. I also have certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, baptism, whooping cough, vaccination, registration, and confirmation. And the measles, both the German and the English variety. Ah, oh, life crowded with incident, though I myself am not in favour of premature experiences. As a matter of procedure, Mr. Worthing, I'd better ask if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. No, oh, about £530,000 inheritance. That is all, Mrs. Bracknell. Good day. I'm so pleased to have seen you. A moment, Mr. Worthing. £530,000? <laughs> Miss Cardew seems to me a most attractive girl, now that I <laughs> look at her. Come here, sweet girl. <laughs> Pretty girl. Your clothes are sadly simple and your hair is almost as if nature had left it. <laughs> we can soon change that. Can it turn around? Okay. Hmm. Okay. Hair needs to be worn a little higher, dear. Style largely depends on how the hair is worn. Andrew? Yes, Uncle There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. I rarely don't give two hoots about her social possibilities. Do not speak disrespectfully of society, Andrew. Only those who can't get into it do that. <laughs> Sweet Claire, you must know that Andrew has nothing but his debts to depend upon, though I myself do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I married Mr. Bracknell, I had no fortune of any kind, but 
I never dreamed of allowing that to stop me. <laughs> uh, I suppose I must give my consent. Oh, sorry for interrupting, Mrs. Bratton, but this engagement is out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian. She got married without my consent, and that consent I have to decline to give. Upon what grounds, may I ask? Andrew is an extremely ostentatiously eligible young man. He has nothing, but he looks everything. What more can someone desire? To speak honestly, Mrs. Bracknell, I don't approve of your nephew's morals. I suspect him of being untruthful. Untruthful, my nephew Andrew? Impossible, he's an Oxford graduate. <laughs> no possible doubt about the matter. This morning, during my temporary absence in London, he attained admission to my household under the false pretense of being my brother. <laughs> Continuing this disgraceful deception, he proceeded in the afternoon events in winning the affections of my only ward. <laughs> and what makes his behaviour all the more heartless is that he was very well aware from the start that I do not have a brother. Not that I have never had a brother, and I certainly intend to have none in the future. I distinctly told him so myself yesterday afternoon. Mr. Worthing, after some careful consideration. I've chosen to entirely overlook my nephew's behaviour towards you, but quite well. Oh, that is very generous of you, Mr. Bracknell. My own decision, however, is unalterable. I do not give my consent. I would beg of you to reconsider. But, Mrs. Bracknell, the matter is entirely in your own hands. From the moment you consent to mine and Gwendolyn's marriage, I must gladly allow your nephew to marry my ward. You must understand that what you propose is completely out of the question. Well then, a passion set up sees what we can all do before too. Oh, bugger! <laughs> Everything is ready for the christening. <laughs> is a christening, sir? Is that not premature? No, please don't express desire for immediate baptism. Oh, baptism at their age? Oh, the idea is grotesque and irreligious. Andrew, I forbid you to be baptised. I will not hear of such excesses. I do understand there'll be no christenings this afternoon. I don't think things are now, Reverend. We very much value to either of us. Oh, I will return to the church immediately. I hear for the past hour and a half Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Uh, so, Prism? <laughs> Did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? I was told you expected me in the vestry, dear Canon. I've been waiting for you for over an hour and a half. Oh, Prism. <laughs> Come here, Prism! <laughs> Where is that baby? 28 years ago, Prism, you left Mr. Bracknell's house, number 104 Upper Grosvenor Street, dear, in possession of a pram containing a baby of the male sex. You never returned. Through the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the pram was located in Bayswater around midnight contains nothing more than a screenplay for a romance film of more than usual trashy sentimentality. <laughs> but there was no baby. Prism, where is that baby? <laughs> Mrs. Brackwell, I admit, shamefully, that I do not know. Oh, God. <clears throat> I intended, as usual, to take the baby out in its pram. I also had with me an old but spacious handbag in which I intended to place a screenplay with the romance I've been writing. It's not important. In a moment of mental malfunction for which I can never forgive myself, I placed the screenplay in the pram and the baby in the handbag. <laughs> Where did you deposit the handbag? Oh, don't ask me, Mr. Worthing. Miss Prism, this is a matter of great importance to me. I must know where you put that handbag. I left it in the cloakroom of one of the larger railway stations in London. <laughs> Victoria, the Brighton Line. Gwendolyn, wait here for me. If you're not too long, I'll wait for you all my life. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Prism, is this the handbag? Examine it all you like. The happiness of more than one life depends on your answer. Oh, well. It looks like my handbag. <laughs> oh, yes. I had my initials engraved when I was in a rather extravagant mood. <laughs> yes, 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 the bag is undoubtedly mine. Oh, Miss Prism, more is restored you than just this handbag. I was the baby you placed in it. You? Yes. <laughs> Mother! <laughs> no. no, 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 Mr. Wooden, there's been an error. There is the, uh, <clears throat> lady who can tell you who you really are. <laughs> Mrs. Bracknell? Yes? I hate to seem intrusive, but would you please inform me of who I am? The news that I am about to tell you will not altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief, and, consequently, Andrew's elder brother. 
Hmm? Hmm. Andy's elder brother? Yes. Well, then I have a brother after all. I mean, I always knew I had a brother. A uh, Claire, have you ever doubted that I had a brother? My <laughs> own. But what own are you? What is your Christian name now that you've become someone else? Oh, good grief. I've quite forgotten that point. Uh, your opinion on the subject is quite unchangeable, I guess. I never change, except to my affections. That is best to be answered. Mrs. Brown. I mean, Aunt Augusta. Uh, a moment. <laughs> At the time that Miss Prism had lost the handbag, had I been christened already? Every luxury that money could buy, including a christening, had been lavished onto you by your fond and loving parents. And being the eldest son, you were naturally christened after your father. Uh, yes, but what's my father's name? His name? His name? was Frank John Moncrief, and I hated him and his mincing little walk. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I particularly don't like the name Frank. See, Gwendolyn, I was Frank all along. I mean, my name is naturally Frank. Frank, my own Frank. I knew that when I met you, you could have no other name. Gwendolyn. It is very painful for a man to find out that all his life he's been speaking nothing but the truth. Can you forgive me? I can. Pray for you are sure to change. My own. My nephew, you seem to be displaying signs of triviality. Actually, Aunt Augusta, I've now realised for the first time in my life the vital importance of being frank. <laughs>